Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute. I want to welcome you here today to um, the science lecture by MIT professor Robert Langer, which is a reminder um, to all of us of the longstanding importance of the sciences in the Institute's academic programming. Over the Institute's first 15 years, and we're celebrating our 15th anniversary this spring, our fellowship program has supported dozens of scientists uh, at all stages of their careers. The papers of prominent women in science are a valued part of the Schlesinger Library's collections. And each year, our Academic Ventures Office sponsors an extensive science program, which includes an annual science symposium that engages the public uh, as well as students and faculty. They mount related lectures, and they fund exploratory seminars that help faculty and former fellows develop new research initiatives, often interdisciplinary ones. This semester, as a continuation of the fall science symposium theme of smart clothes, and perhaps some of you were here in the fall to experience that with us, we will further explore the frontiers of wearable technology in three lectures. And on April 10th and 11th, our annual gender conference, this year titled, Who Decides Gender, Medicine, and the Public's Health, will touch on subjects related to today's lecture. A performance by Eve Ensler on Thursday evening will launch that conference uh, that will take place on Friday. So I'm inviting you to, to consult this card that you were given as you came in uh, and see all the things that we have planned for the next two months. And if you want more details, you can find them on our website. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Robert Langer to the Radcliffe Institute. When our life sciences advisor uh, last year, Joan Ruderman, first urged us to invite Professor Langer to Radcliffe, she told us that people in the Boston area rarely get to hear him because everybody else in the world wants to, and he's often traveling around. Today's lecture, then, is a rare opportunity for us to learn from Professor Langer on his home turf, and we are delighted that he accepted our invitation to speak today. Robert Langer is the David H. Koch Institute professor at MIT. Professor Langer is recognized internationally for his innovative approaches to a range of scientific and medical problems that many believed were impossible to solve. A bold thinker in the lab and a savvy entrepreneur in the biotech boardroom, he is known for his ability to identify high-impact research and then turn it into life-saving and life-improving inventions. Professor Langer has received over 220 major awards, including the US National Medal of Science, the US National Medal of Technology and Innovation, the Charles Stark Drake Prize, which I am told is considered the Nobel Prize of Engineering, and the Millennium Technology Prize, the world's largest technology prize. And he was just awarded the 2014 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, which recognizes excellence in research aimed at curing intractable diseases and extending human life. Robert Langer blazed an unconventional path for a chemical engineer when he chose to work at the intersection of engineering and medicine. As a postdoc in Judah Falkman's surgery lab at Children's Hospital, Langer developed innovative systems for providing controlled release delivery of drugs in the body. The drugs and drug delivery methods resulting from his research have proved to be among the most successful biopharmaceuticals for treating cancer and other vascular diseases, including heart disease and diabetes. Professor Langer's work has also created a whole new field of biotechnology known as tissue engineering, making possible the development of biomaterials such as cardiac stents and artificial skin. His pioneering work has improved the health of millions of people. How Langer has achieved so many breakthroughs is as important as the big ideas behind them. His lab at the David H. Koch Center for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT 
cultivates a collaborative, multidisciplinary approach focused on high-impact research with multiple applications. So when engineers, material scientists, mathematicians, biologists, and others work together, they combine knowledge from di pre previously disparate lines of research to break new ground. And with great success. Professor Langer has over 1,000 patents issued or pending around the world. They have been used by over 250 pharmaceutical, chemical, biotech, and medical device companies, many of which he helped to start. Not only is Robert Langer a prolific inventor, he is also a dedicated teacher and mentor. When his lab first started, he worked primarily with MIT undergraduates, I'm told. And today, undergraduates still work alongside graduate students and postdocs. He has said that he is most proud of his some 500 former students. Many now hold prestigious faculty positions and run their own labs. Others lead medical schools and schools of engineering, head biotech companies, and advise venture capital investors. Like those many students, today we have a marvelous chance to learn from Professor Langer about biomaterials for the 21st century and how they will change our lives. So please join, join me in warmly welcoming Robert Langer. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice. Thank you. Um, I thought what I'd do, I had a great talk with uh, a lot of the students at lunch today, and I thought maybe a way to start is just to tell you a little bit about my career when I was actually their age. And a lot of people ask me, how does a chemical engineer get into the medical field, especially when you're as old as I am? Uh, and, and so I thought I'd start back at, at that time. So I was actually a graduate student at MIT, and I got my doctorate in 1974. And for those of you that are old enough to remember, in 1974, just like a couple of years ago, there was this gas shortage. And what happened is, is that the prices of gas kept going up and up. But it was actually even worse in 1974, because if you had a car, say, in Boston, you actually had to wait in the gas station in line for about two hours to get your tank filled up. The consequence of that, though, is if you were a young chemical engineer like I was, is you got a lot of job offers. And, 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 and so what happened was is that all these oil companies had all these offers. And pretty much every one of my classmates at MIT in 1974 went into the oil industry. And I thought, you know, that's what I should do too. They had so many jobs. And so I applied to these oil companies. And I actually got 20 job offers, four actually from Exxon alone. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like I was that great or anything. They just had so many job offers. One of them made quite an impression on me. I remember going to Exxon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I remember being there. And when I was there, one of the older engineers said to me, he said, you know, if you could just increase the yield of this one chemical, by 0.1%, he said, that would be wonderful. He said, that would be worth billions of dollars. And I remember flying back to Boston that night thinking to myself that, that I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> Started to think more and more about what I did want to do. And, and that wasn't so easy because everybody, you know, like I said, was going to these oil companies. When I was a, a graduate student at MIT, though, one of the things I spent a lot of time doing, actually right near here, is I helped start a school for poor kids called the Group School. And I got very excited about it. I, I helped develop a new chemistry curriculum and things like that. And one day, I saw an ad to be an assistant professor at City College in New York to do just that, develop new chemistry curriculum. So I wrote them a letter applying for the job. But they uh, didn't write me back. <laughs> but I really liked that idea, so I found all the you know, ads I could to apply for assistant professor of chemistry education. I found about 40 different colleges, many of them not even that good. But I, I wrote 40 letters, and I remember not one of them wrote me back. You know, I guess if you're not in the right box, like the chemistry education box, even if you got your degree from MIT, you don't, you don't get a letter back. So that wasn't going so well. So I started to think, what other ways might I use my chemical engineering education to help people? And so I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. And they uh, didn't write back either. <laughs> and then one day, one of the postdocs in the laboratory that I was in at MIT said to me, he said, Bob, he said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. 
He, he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. But uh, anyhow, I wrote to Dr. Folkman, and he was kind enough to offer me a position. And I thought I'd actually start this talk by showing you a picture from the New York Times in 1971 of Dr. Folkman's vision of how tumors grow. And his idea is summarized here, that somehow a tumor cell becomes abnormal. It grows as a three-dimensional mass, gets to be about a million cells. But then it runs into a nutrition problem. Cells in the center die because they can't get nutrients or get rid of waste. Um, but the way the tumor solves that problem, he said, was that it secretes a signal called tumor angiogenesis factor, or TAF. And that causes the blood vessels surrounding it, which are normally quiescent, to start multiplying and growing like crazy. And they go directionally to the tumor, and they cause it to grow bigger and bigger. It solves the nutrition problem. And not only does it grow bigger and bigger, of course, it can spread or metastasize through those blood vessels, ultimately killing. His idea, Dr. Folkman's idea, was that if one could stop blood vessels, that might be a whole new way of thinking about treating cancer. So what he asked me to do was actually see if we could isolate what would become the first angiogenesis inhibitor. How do you think about a problem like that? We kind of broke it up into two areas. One, where might we find such a substance? And the thinking in the lab at that time was possibly cartilage. Cartilage is in your nose and your knee, and it doesn't have any blood vessels. And we had some baby rabbits in the lab, and we could get cartilage from them. And I tried that, but we couldn't get very much cartilage from them. Now, one of the things you learn in engineering is scale up. So, so I went to cows, and I found a slaughterhouse in uh, Cambridge where they had a cow, in Clay Street, where they had cows. And I remember going there and getting some of the cow bones and bringing them back to the lab. But still, you know, that's like one bone or two bones. So what I wanted to do was, you know, I needed more. I had to find out where do all the bones and all the slaughterhouses go. And it turns out they go to these meatpacking places in South Boston. So I made an arrangement with them where I'd get all their bones, and I'd drive down there three times a week, bringing their bones back to the lab. And then I had to scrape the meat off of the cartilage and put it through various procedures. I'm actually going to show you a picture. I'm actually quite proud of this. Um, this is one of those bones. And basically, um, what you see, normally there's some meat on it, but you take a periosteal elevator, you scrape it off, then you slice this off. And what we would do is put it through various extraction procedures and various purification procedures. So what we'd have at the end is maybe 100 different test tubes with different things we want to test. That then brings up the second issue. How do we test it? So one of the biggest problems, actually, in, in, in really, if you look back at the history of medicine, is find, finding a bioassay for substances like this. How do you come up with a bioassay for seeing if you could inhibit new blood vessels? It's not easy, because if any in vivo assay that you'd want to use has background blood vessels. So we needed to think of a way to address that. Now, Mike Gimbroni had worked in Dr. Folkman's lab before I did, and he had shown that if you put certain tumors in the eye, they would actually cause, over an eight-week period, blood vessels to grow. So what we thought about was maybe for the bioassay, we could use the eye, use an ophthalmic microscope to measure the longest blood vessel. But what we could do is uh, something like this. Put the tumor in, which would be a V2 carcinoma, create what we'd call a controlled release polymer that had to have two properties. One be inert and biocompatible in the rabbit eye. And that was very difficult because the eye is very sensitive. And two, it had to be able to release for a long time any of the molecules in cartilage, which are often quite large because they're proteins or proteoglycans. And that had never been done before. So that was what we needed to do. It turns out Dr. Folkman was on the board of scientific advisors of the one company in the world, ALZA, that had worked at all in this area of trying to deliver molecules. And he asked them, went out there, I remember in 1974, 75, and asked them, could they help us? But they said no. They said that's not something that could be done. Basically, they said what happens is, see, you could take a tiny molecule, maybe that might get through, but a large molecule cannot slowly diffuse through solid polymers. The thinking was, any more than any of us could walk through that wall. In fact, in the literature, there were similar statements uh, that basically the use of polymer matrices for slow-release systems was virtually restricted to small molecules. The only thing that I really had going for me is, is I didn't know any of this. <laughs> so so I, I spent 
several years working in the laboratory, really almost Edisonian-like, experimenting with different techniques. And I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. <laughs> but eventually, I found one way to get it to work. I was able to take certain what are called very hydrophobic polymers. Um, for polymer chemists in the audience, I'm, they might be ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer or lactic glycolic acid copolymer. We could dissolve them in certain organic solvents, add the drug, mix it often at a very low temperature, and dry off the solvent. And then we'd make these little microspheres. Here's one cut in half. And what we published actually in Nature in 1976 was that you could release these substances for over 100 days. In these early studies, the release rates are, are not constant. But later on, using some engineering approaches, we figured out how to m model it and make it constant. And here is an example where we released albumin, uh, 68,000 molecular weight, at a pretty steady rate for over 50 days. Now, one of the things, of course, that's important when you're in science is, is you know, when you're a scientist, is you end up having to give lectures. And in 1976, for the first time in my life, I got asked to give a talk at a major scientific meeting. It was actually in Midland, Michigan, which is a big polymer center. It's where Dow and Dow Corning is. And I had never really given a talk before, except in eighth grade. <laughs> and that eighth grade talk didn't go real well. I remember that I wrote it out. That was only a minute and a half talk. I wrote it out. And the night before, I stood in front of my parents' mirror for probably three hours reciting it over and over again. And then the day came, and I got up in front of my eighth grade class, and I kind of recited it. And for the first minute and two seconds, I, I did all right. And then I could not remember the next word. And I stood up there in front of my eighth grade class for another minute and said nothing until my eighth grade teacher finally told me to sit down and gave me a not particularly good grade. I, I think it was an F. So now, you know, many years later, in 1976, I'm doing this talk, and I was very nervous about it. I, I was a lot younger then. That was, geez, I hate to think about it. It was 38 years ago. Uh, so I had, you know, a lot more hair and stuff like that, and, um, and it was darker. And, and I remember giving this talk to this very distinguished group of polymer chemists and engineers. I practiced this talk for two weeks and uh, to a tape recorder. And, and the day finally came, and I gave the talk. And actually, when I got done with it this time, I thought I did better. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. I didn't stammer too much. And I thought when I was done with this talk that these older chemists and engineers, being nice people, would want to encourage me, this young guy. And when I got done, I stepped off the podium, and a whole bunch of them came up to me, and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> they said basically just what the ALSA people said, that. Large molecules can't slowly diffuse through the polymers. And they also pointed out that we were using organic solvents, and that should destroy whatever we put in. But what would happen, and I think this is always the key in science, is that in the next few years, various research groups around the world repeated what we did. And the question shifted to how could this possibly happen? To understand it, what we did is, uh, you know, we took uh, they ha one of the things they have in these medical labs are cryomicrotomes to cut tissues. So we began to use them to cut polymers. So we could actually visualize what was going on. So on the next slide, what you're going to see is a five micron thin section of one of the polymers we used, ethylene vinyl acetate, that doesn't have a drug in it. And you have this sheet and a molecule, like I say, 300 molecular weight or greater can't diffuse from one side to the other. But if you put a drug in it, and now we're going to put a red drug in it so you can see it, you see this phase set. This is before any release. This is the white is the polymer part, the red is the drug part. So you see these two distinct phases. If you release this for, say, a year, and then you cut a thin section, it looks very different. Left behind where the drug was are these pores. And these pores are large enough so that molecules, even millions of molecular weight, can get through. But it turns out that if you do a lot of serial sectioning and image analysis or scanning electron microscopy, both of which we did, what you see is that the pores are interconnected. They have tight constrictions between them. And they're also incredibly winding and tortuous. So it takes a very long time to get through them. One way I sometimes explain this to people when I lecture around the world is that it's, it's usually a lot like driving a car through Boston. <laughs> and chemical engineering, we have this term called tortuosity. And I would say that both these systems in Boston have high tortuosity. And over the years, our students 
have developed mathematical models and ways of understanding it. So you can actually predict what the tortuosities are, control them, and you can actually design these systems so you can get delivery anywhere from like a day or two to over three years. Now, since we could do this, we could then go back and address the angiogenesis problem. And so you could remember this was the assay that we were trying to use, tumor here, polymer here. But now we were able to do this. So what we did is we probably did something like 1,000 rabbits, 2,000 eyes. And we had all these fractions. And I should say almost every one of them did not work. I kind of think of those as like almost the controls. And in a way, they really are, because basically we treated them the same way, just to slightly different purification procedures. But one of them actually eventually worked. And I thought, and I apologize for showing this if people don't like blood, but it's the only way to get this across. So what I'm going to show you are, are rabbit eyes where, in, in, in fact, uh, Marsha Moses, uh, who's here, actually now runs the lab that Dr. Folkman once run, ran, actually did a lot of this. But basically, um, when she was a postdoc with me, but basically, you know, what, what you'll see is that you put the tumor in, you put the polymer in, and you wait, say, eight weeks, and you'll see blood vessels. So I'm just going to show you one typical control and one typical experiment. And they are pretty representative. And you can actually get a graph because you can take the ophthalmic microscope and measure the length of the longest blood vessel. But what you see is here's the tumor. It's about eight weeks after the start of the experiment. If you don't have the cartilage-derived inhibitor or you have a control substance, you get the sheet of blood vessels growing over the polymer, which you can no longer see on its way to the tumor. If you looked at this eye just two weeks later, it would actually be three-dimensional out of the orbit of the eye. It would ultimately kill the animal. However, when you put the inhibitor in, the blood vessels avoid the polymer. Probably 60% of the time, these tumors never grow uh, beyond this little sheet. Um, we published the first paper on this showing that you could do this in 1976. But then it took another 28 years and worked by many, many companies like Genentech and others before the first inhibitor was approved by FDA. But starting in 19, I'm sorry, starting in 2004, what happened is many angiogenesis inhibitors got approved by the FDA. And here's just a partial list. Uh, and, and we see all these different types of cancer, not only cancer, but different eye diseases like macular degeneration, which before this was only able to be treated by lasers. There were no drugs to treat it. But now there's different drugs like Alia and Lucentis and so forth that can actually, in some cases, even reverse macular degeneration, which is one of the leading causes of blindness in the United States. Um, so what's happened now is that many, many people use these. I think something like well over 10 million patients have used these. And the FDA today basically says there's four ways to think about treating cancer. Chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, or angiogenesis treatment. And many times you use these synergistically. We, we also thought that not only might these systems, these controlled release systems, be useful in sort of basic science applications like providing assays for angiogenesis, which they still do today. All these basically were isolated using, using these assays that we developed. But we also thought that they might be useful in their own right. Because with the advent of biotechnology, so many drugs that uh, began to be developed were not drugs that you could take orally or by conventional means. They would have short lifetimes. And if you, by the way, injected them, they might be destroyed immediately. So it seemed to me that we could also use these polymer systems therapeutically someday to deliver all kinds of different molecules and permit all kinds of new therapies. So Larry Brown, one of our graduate students, just as a proof of principle, delivered insulin, which is 6,000 molecular weight. We just basically designed these little aspirin-sized pills. And you could put it in a diabetic rat, and it lowered the blood sugar for a month. I remember Dr. Folkman saying to me early on that we should file a patent in this area. You know, it's interesting. We were working at Children's Hospital. This was the 1970s, and I think Children's Hospital is probably the best children's hospital in the world. But they never had a patent. And Dr. Folkman said we should file a patent. And you know, he was a pretty influential guy, so they did. And the examiner turned it down. That was 1976. He also turned it down in 1977, 1978, 1979, 1980, and 1981. And the lawyer for the hospital told me that, Bob, this is never going to happen. The guy doesn't understand science, and we should just give up. And I'm wasting a lot of money for the hospital. But I, I don't like to give up that easily. And I was trying to think, how could we convince this examiner that he should allow the patent? 
you know, legally, of course. And, <laughs> and so science wasn't really working very well. So I started thinking, what other way could we do it? And it occurred, you know, everybody I remember when I started doing this told me it was impossible, it couldn't work, it went against scientific principles. And I wondered whether anybody ever wrote that down. So I did something called a science citation search, which means I took our 1976 Nature paper and I looked at it to see who wrote stuff about it. And I actually found a number of interesting articles, and I'll just show you one. This was in, so I did this in 1982, and I found this 1979 paper which referred back to our 1976 paper. I had no idea this was written. I'll just read this one quote to you that I found. And he basically is, this, they're basically describing, like you say, these are five of the top people in the world, they're basically describing the field. They're saying generally the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates through polymers. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising, that, that's actually a very good word for the patent examiner, results that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed that to the children's hospital lawyer, and he was very excited. He flew down to Washington to show it to the examiner. And the examiner said, gee, I had no idea. He said, I tell you what, I will allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a true story. So I, I wrote each of them, and they were all kind enough to write back that they did really write it. <laughs> we got this very broad patent, first in the history of Children's Hospital. And what that did was give us leverage so that what we could do is license that to different places. And actually, unfortunately, you know, I had to get involved in starting. I wasn't expecting that, but I'd get involved myself in starting companies because in the beginning, you know, like I was probably the only one that cared about it. But today, through, the effort, through those efforts, there are all kinds of products in the market. For example, there are peptides like luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone analogs. 1,200 molecular weight. And if you try to swallow them or take them nasally or put them in a patch, nothing gets in. If you inject them, stuff gets in, but it's destroyed in less than a minute. So what was done is to put them in little microspheres like I just showed you. And originally, they lasted for a month. Now they actually can make them that last for four months using, again, some of these design principles I went over. And today, this is uh, probably the most widely used treatment for advanced prostate cancer, endometriosis, or precocious puberty. It's been used by many millions of patients. There are a lot of other examples, too. For example, I don't know how many of you here saw the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. Did many of you see it? So you may recall, what disease did he have in that movie? Schizophrenia. Does anybody remember how he was treated medically? He had electric shock therapy. Not pleasant. Today, he'd probably get this. This is Risperdal, uh, and so they put them in little microspheres again, and they can inject them once every few weeks. This has been used in about 5 million patients, uh, and it's had a big effect on preventing uh, suicides and hospitalizations. This is a once-a-month a treatment for um, either uh, alcoholism or, um, or cocaine addiction. This actually is now... Uh, becoming widely used for treating type 2 diabetes. That's a glucagon-like peptide, which you ha people had to inject multiple times a day. Now you can inject it in these microspheres once a week. And so this is just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of, of what's happening. And many, many more of these, I, I hope, will continue to be used as, as time goes on. But still, what we've done, if you think about it, there's still a lot of limitations. These systems permit new drug therapies, but what they do is they protect drugs that are usually have short lifetimes. They are injected subcutaneously or intramuscularly. Um, they control the drug level. But what they don't do is control its location. And certainly what you'd love to be able to do is control its location. How, could you take an anti-cancer drug and deliver it right to the cell you want? Could you take someday siRNA or MR, mRNA or DNA and deliver it to the cell you want? To do that, we thought a number of years ago, the way to do that is to use nanotechnology. This is way before people started to talk about nanotechnology. But it's still challenging because what we wanted to do was put these drugs in a nanoparticle and direct the nanoparticle right to the site we wanted it to do. The problem is if you try to inject a nanoparticle into somebody, into the bloodstream, to find its way where you want to go, it, it runs into 
a lot of bad cells that want to eat it, macrophages. And so you have to figure out a way to fix that. And the way we did this now over 20 years ago was we took FDA-approved materials, not based really on the same principle that I mentioned for making the microspheres, but then we would add something to the outside surface of it that was actually FDA-approved called polyethylene glycol, which is very much like water. It tracks a lot of water. And our theory was is that these cells that would normally eat these nanoparticles would just see water, which maybe they'd see anyhow, so it's kind of a disguise, and maybe they wouldn't eat them so quickly. So we made these. This was done by Rexendra Greff. Then that hopefully would address, to a certain extent, avoiding the bad cells, so to speak, but we still have to find our way to the right cells. About six years later, Omid Farrakhanazad uh, joined our lab as a fellow. Omid's now uh, associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and uh, he uh, worked out a way to not only put the polyethylene glycol on, but add targeting molecules on, which could be aptamers or antibodies or small peptides. And it's actually quite complex. You have to get the right density of each of these to get this to work. Omid's also very entrepreneurial, and so one of the things that uh, he and I did is we actually started another little company called Bind, and uh, they actually have developed whole manufacturing plants for making nanoparticles, which are quite sophisticated. And so here's an example of a nanoparticle manufacturing plant, Bind's in Cambridge. And these are now being used in a whole range of clinical trials. Um, and now, and, and, and so what this largely showed so far, there's probably been well over 100 patients treated the trials show uh, pretty good safety, uh, the, even some hints of efficacy. This was published in Science Translational Medicine. These are CAT scans of uh, human patients, uh, and you see tumors here, but they go away 42 days later. Tumor here, again, it goes away 42 days later. And now they're in uh, more advanced trials in, in a, against a range of tumors. Also, what's been exciting is that Amgen, Pfizer, and uh, AstraZeneca are all have made uh, arrangements, actually multi-million dollar arrangements, to put their drugs in these nanoparticles. And so there's a whole range of things uh, where hopefully someday we'll see, uh, you know, some new therapies coming out of this. There's another nanotechnology example I, I, I wanted to give you. You know, about 20 years ago also, I was watching this television show on PBS about how they made microchips in the computer industry. And when I watched this show, I thought to myself, watching about how they made them, that this would be a great way to make a drug delivery system. Now, maybe if you spent 30 years of your life working on drug delivery systems, any TV show you saw, you might think that. But when I saw it, I had this idea, and I talked to Michael Sima, who's one of my colleagues at MIT, who's a ceramics expert, and we got a very good graduate student named John Santini. And here was my idea, that basically we could make a chip, rather than be electrical, it would be chemical. And so the idea is we make this chip, you could actually build little wells in it, and in these wells you could actually put drugs, it could be the same drug at different doses, or you could put multiple drugs in. Literally, if the drugs are potent enough, you could have a pharmacy on a chip. And you could cover them with something like a platinum alloy or gold, and you have photolithography where you can build all this circuitry in. So this is a cutaway. These are the wells. So John Santini, for his PhD thesis, made some of these. This is an early chip top view of it, bottom view of it. This only has 34 wells. Now we have one with like over 400 wells. Uh, and this is United States dime. This is like a short flat chip, but you can make them literally any size or shape. So you can make them cylindrical, where, very thin, where you could inject them. You can make them bigger or smaller, um, and so forth. Um, let me just show you how they work. The, the drug's hermetically sealed underneath the metal, and it'll stay like that for years. But if you, by remote control, even something like this, come along and apply one volt by remote control, what happens actually in nanoseconds, these are actually nano wells, what happens in nanoseconds is the cover comes off. And when the cover comes off, whatever's underneath it can come out. So what we showed, and it's another paper in Nature by John and us, is that we put different levels of drug in different wells and notice how the drug comes out very sharply at these different times. Here's more like the pharmacy on the chip idea. So over the years, what we did is uh, we moved from in vitro, which this is, to small animals, to larger animals like dogs, and then two years ago we did the first human trials. And what I'm going to show you might sound like space-age medicine, but it's actually done. So let me just uh, go over what we did. This is now in human beings. 
And what we did is we, the chips are actually implanted in humans, and you can communicate with them over a special radio frequency called the Medical Implant Communication Service Band. It's approved by both the FCC and the FDA. Sometimes people ask me, well, well couldn't somebody tamper with it and, you know, get, you know, release or something? I think we have bigger problems than that. You know, we're still trying to get everything to work. But what we built into this is actually a special code that only the doctor or patient can know. So really, to do this, you'd have to know the right frequency and the right code if you wanted to change the dose. We also built into it a bi-directional communications link between the chip and the receiver. The receiver, by the way, could be this. It could be a cell phone. It could be whatever you want. And I'll mention that maybe a little bit more in a minute. And it gives you all kinds of information, like did you take the dose, the battery life, and so forth. Some of these might not seem so important, but as I've gotten older, I've realized that they become increasingly important. For example, my dad uh, passed away when he was 61, so for the last, of heart disease. So for the last 15 years, I've taken a statin drug. And, you know, I try to take it every day. People may not realize that. Denny Ossiello is chief of medicine. He told me that the average compliance of people taking statin drugs is three months. Pretty amazing. Compliance is just a, a huge deal. But anyhow, for me, I, I try to do it. But, you know, the problem is, is that you know, I take the drug, I, use, I have the little vial in the bathroom, and sometimes I go back about two hours later and I look at that vial and I said to myself, did I take that drug? But I got this idea then. I said, you know what I can do is, after I take the drug, I turn the vial upside down. But then, you know, sometimes I walk back two hours later and I said to myself, but did I turn that vial upside down yesterday or today? <laughs> So I, I really think having, you know, something like this, electrical signal, uh, and you'd have a permanent record in, in your house or the hospital about everything. Let me tell you about the trial. It's done in Denmark, just as a proof of principle, or eight patients. Also, we wanted to pick a situation which was not an easy test and that would have hopefully have clinical impact. We picked osteoporosis. And osteoporosis, uh, and, and all the women were like 70 years old or older. The drug that they were supposed to take is a large molecule, parathyroid hormone. And the reason we chose it was not only we felt could have a clinical impact, but again, whenever you do this stuff, people will tell you why your idea won't work. Biggest reason people tell us this idea won't work is they say you'll get fibrous encapsulation, meaning that tissue will surround it and the drug is too big to get out. So we picked a big drug. If it gets out, everything smaller hopefully would get out. Also, we felt it's one where we could have a clinical impact. It turns out that 77% of the women who take these daily injections of parathyroid hormone drop out. They don't do it, 77%. Uh, and actually, you could think, well, couldn't you use continuous release? That's actually bad. You know, like the microspheres, that's bad. You, you really want pulsatile release. Otherwise, you get, uh, you get bone resorption. So what was done in these trials uh, in Denmark was a, a small office procedure in the doctor's office to do the implant. And what was exciting about the trial is that you got the same pharmacokinetics with actually less variability. I don't think that that's important in this particular case, but it may be important in some treatments. And then these are three measures of how your, you know, cal calcium and various collagen fragments of how good you were doing. And you got the same statistically as daily injections. Let me just show you a little bit of the data. So this is human uh, data uh, at days 60, 68, 76, and 84. And notice that you get really pretty much superposition. There's almost no difference, even over these long times. Here's a picture of actually what the chips look like. This is actually a, a, a fairly decent-sized chip, not that big, but uh, that was placed. But you have, um, you have uh, the chip itself. It's in this titanium case. Uh, inside that is a power source, a computer program and various electrical components. What you can't see, on the back side, we've actually imprinted an antenna, and that's how you communicate with it. You can send signals by remote control uh, over a distance. You do get some encapsulation, but I'd say that's about 1 50th what a pacemaker gets, and you get, uh, this is a histology, so you see no inflammatory cells. Um, so now we're actually moving in multiple directions. Direction one is we're actually developing a two-year device for this which could clearly be clinically useful. Also, a second area that's been very interesting is uh, about a year and a half ago, Bill Gates came to see me. And you may know that he and his wife, Melinda, are very interested in empowering women, particularly in the third world, to be able to control birth control. So they said, well, could we design actually a 16-year implant 
that the woman could turn on and off whenever she wanted. Not easy to do with any conventional system, but with this, you can, because you can just turn the signal on and off. And again, using a controller. In fact, they even did these surveys in Africa about what the women would prefer uh, to you know, have, like a cell phone or something like this or so forth. They've actually given over $6 million already to try to do this. So we're actually designing these systems and still uh, being studied, but it's, it's quite exciting. And we can actually make them pretty small. Third area that we're looking at is you can actually put uh, biosensors in these chips. So you could actually detect signals in the human body. And someday, what we hope to do is make a system that can detect signals in the human body and then tell the chip how much to deliver. So, so th these are just some of the directions that we hope will happen in the 21st century. So far, what I've done is I've, I've told you how we could take materials that already exist in nature and make them do things that they've never done before. But I also want to talk about the materials themselves. You know, one of the things that I was curious about when I started working in the hospital and I got more involved in materials is how did materials find their way into medicine? Was it through chemists or chemical engineers? Well, as I looked at that, I found that almost never to be the case. Almost always the driving force for bringing materials into medicine were medical doctors. And what they did is they urgently wanted to solve a medical problem. And what they would do is to solve it, they would go to their house and find some object that kind of resembled the organ or tissue they wanted to fix, then they'd use it in a person. For example, in 1967, some of the clinicians at NIH wanted to make an artificial heart. And they said, what object has a good flex life like a heart? And they said, a lady's girdle. So they made the artificial heart out of a lady's girdle. That was 1967. But that's still true in 2014. Because once you start down that path from a regulatory like FDA standpoint, it's not so easy to change. And the artificial heart, by the way, hasn't worked real well. You know, you could even read like the Boston Globe. And what you'll see is when people have the artificial heart, one of the things that's happened is the blood hits the surface of it. Patient gets a clot, the clot goes to the brain, patient gets a stroke, and they may die. But if you think about it, something that was designed to be a lady's girdle is probably not the optimal blood contacting material. And this problem pervades all of medicine. Dialysis tubing with sausage casing, vascular graft, that's artificial blood vessel, was a surgeon in Texas going to a clothes store to see what he could sew well with. Breast implants, one was a lubricant, another actually a mattress stuffing. You can probably think of the logic. Now, one of the things that you learn in chemical engineering is kind of like design. And so I started thinking that rather than use this approach, going to your house, what if we ask the question, what do we really want in a biomaterial from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint, and biology standpoint, then could we design the material we want from first principles? So that's actually a lot of what we do in the lab today, but I thought I would just give you one example. And that example is here. So when we started this and uh, had this idea, the only material that was approved by the FDA that was synthetic and degradable were polyester sutures. And they dissolve like this. They start out like this, then they get spongy, and then they fall apart, which is okay for some drugs. But if you had a potentially toxic drug like insulin or an anti-cancer drug, it could just dump out and it could be fatal. So we said from an engineering standpoint, what we really want is this, surface erosion, layer by layer erosion then the drug could not dump out. So how do you do this? So again, we made this like a, a design problem. And we would ask different design questions, like what bonds should we use, what uh, building blocks should we use, and so forth. I, I won't go into all of the, the questions, but, but basically we asked about three or four design questions. And um, what we came up with was that the bonds we wanted to use were what are called the anhydride bonds. And I got some very good chemists involved, and particularly uh, Mike Marletta, who's now head of the Scripps, to try to come up with building blocks, what we call monitors, that, monomers, that would be non-toxic. And some of the ones we came up were this. We, we wanted molecules that would keep uh, the water out and that we could adjust the ratios to get different release rates. And some of our students showed that you could um, get different release rates by changing the ratio of those two. So we could actually make little millimeter thick systems that depending on the ratio of those two units could last anywhere from two weeks to many years. So you could begin to dial in 
however long you wanted these to last. And that would give you the opportunity to design new kinds of medical treatments. So let me give you an example. In 1985, Henry Bram, who's a graduate of uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, came to see me. He was just starting his career at Johns Hopkins as an assistant professor in neurosurgery. And he wanted to have a better way of treating glioblastoma multiforme, which is a uniformly fatal disease. These are statistics that he would show me then. The only drug at that time that was approved for treating brain cancer was this one, BCNU. And when you gave it, it would be injected systemically. It would travel throughout the body, causing very, very bad side effects. And so when he talked to me, one of the things that we wondered with these new materials is could we introduce the idea of local chemotherapy? Could we, like in this case, allow the neurosurgeon like Dr. Brem to operate on the patient, remove as much of the tumor as he could, but before he closes up the patient, line the surgical cavity with little wafers, BC and U polymers. Now, normally, the drug lasts for 12 minutes, but if you put it in the polymer, it's protected. So what Dr. Brem wanted was a polymer that would be degradable so it wouldn't accumulate in the brain, surface degrading so it couldn't dump this very toxic drug, and also from other studies they did at Hopkins, they asked if we could design it to last for a week. And again, we could do that just by adjusting the chemistry like I showed you. And maybe most significantly, we could get local delivery, expose the cells in the brain we wanted to the drug, but ideally low concentrations in the rest of the body. Now, if you're a scientist at Harvard or MIT or wherever, and you, you have an idea like this, like new materials or so forth, you have to raise money to do it. And the way we generally would raise money is that we would write grants, and we might send them to NIH, National Institutes of Health, and they would have study sections, which are made of various professors at other universities to review them. So that's what I did. And we sent them in, and we did terribly. I actually uh, have this slide. I entitled it, This Approach Will Not Work Because. So we sent the grant in, for originally in 1980. Um, took them a year to review it. but. Um, we sent it in, and the chemist said, this is impossible, you will never be able to synthesize these polymers. But I had a very good graduate student at the time named Howie Rosen. Howie later became president of the Alza Corporation, the company I mentioned became a $12 billion corporation that they sold to uh, Johnson & Johnson. Howie, by the way, was also elected to the National Academy of Engineering, which is uh, about the highest honor you can have for a, a, an engineer. He was elected about six years ago uh, for, for this work and other things. And he was able to synthesize it. So we sent the grant back, and the reviewers uh, looked at it, and they said, well, still won't work. Even if you could synthesize them, you have these reactive bonds, these anhydrides. They'll react with whatever you put in. But another couple of postdocs, uh, Cam Leung, who's now the James Duke professor at Duke University, also was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and Bob Linhart, who's Constellation Professor of Chemistry at RPI, and they showed that um, it did not react. Sent it back again. And the reviewer said, well, we still shouldn't fund it. These polymers are fragile. They'll break in the body um, and, uh, because they're low molecular weight. But I had another couple of postdocs, uh, Abi Dome, who later became chairman of medicinal chemistry at Hebrew University, and Edith Mathiewicz, who uh, is now full professor of bioengineering at Brown University, also was recently elected to the National Academy of Inventors. And they showed we're able to make polymers very high molecular weight and were very strong. Sent it back again, and the reviewer said, well, still will not work. You know, these are brand new materials. They'll be toxic uh, to animals or people, so we still shouldn't fund it. But I had another uh, graduate student, Cato Lorenzen. Cato uh, later uh, became uh, a dean of medicine at the University of Connecticut, was elected to both the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering and the National Institutes of Inventors, and he showed that actually, which supported Marletta's hypothesis, that they were safe. Anyhow, this kept going on and on until 1996 when the FDA approved it. It was actually the first time in over 20 years that the FDA approved a new treatment for brain cancer and the first time they ever approved this idea of local chemotherapy. You can probably tell from the way I'm speaking that I'm very, very proud of how well all the MIT graduate students and postdocs did. They became CEOs of major corporations, deans, uh, hold endowed chairs, received uh, international honors. Whereas the reviewers at the other universities, uh, they didn't do too well. 
Now, I would like to actually show you what this operation looks like, but if anybody's squeamish and doesn't like the sight of blood, you, you shouldn't look. But let me just show you these pictures, and I'll just, that, that is a warning. So let me just show you a couple pictures. These are uh, little wafers going into the brain. Usually they put six or seven in and close up the brain. You know, it's actually very hard to get good advice when I give a talk. But about 12 years ago, I was giving a lecture at MIT, and my wife, Laura, who actually went to Radcliffe and Harvard, came to the talk. And I asked her at the end of the talk, I said, what did you think? And so Laura said to me, she said, Bob, the talk was all right. That, by the way, is extremely high praise. <laughs> but she said, you know, you had those two bloody slides on uh, for about 10 minutes where you were explaining every detail to all these poor engineers, and they were all turning green. So ever after that, I, I always take her advice, I uh, did what I did today. I showed those slides quickly. I gave a warning and so forth. But I, I do want to tell you the sequel to that, which was that two years after that talk, I got asked to give this dinner speech. <laughs> but this dinner speech was actually to a group of neurosurgeons. And I did the same thing. I gave them a warning. I showed those slides really quickly. And at the end of the dinner speech, uh, a number of the neurosurgeons came up to me and they said, you know those two bloody slides you showed? I, I said, yes. They said, those were fine. They said, no problem. You could have left those on as long as you wanted. <laughs> they said, but those chemical formulas. <laughs> you know, to leave those on for a neurosurgeon is terrible. So I kind of adjust what I do depending on who I talk to. I do want to just show you a little bit of the clinical data. This is what's called phase three data, which is right before FDA approval. Um, and this was done in Finland and Sweden. And what you see is at the end of a year, you see increased survival. At the end of two years, you see almost a five-fold improvement. It's not a cure by any means, but uh, it does uh, reduce suffering and it does prolong survival. And this has now been used for the last 18 years for fairly localized tumors, uh, you know, as an adjunct to surgery. Also, the principle of localized chemotherapy using polymers is, is being more and more widely used. In fact, one of the best examples after we published this actually was done by another one of my uh, uh, former students, Elazar Edelman, who's also a professor at Harvard and MIT, and that is actually in the area of drug-eluting stents. He and uh, several companies did uh, really excellent work, uh, and about seven years after that, uh, after the study I just showed you, this got approved by the FDA. So a stent is, uh, for people who have heart disease, what they do is you have a clogged blood vessel, they put these stents, they look like a Chinese finger puzzle, in, and that props them open. But about 50% of the time, what happens is the cells, like smooth muscle cells surrounding it, proliferate and they close off the blood vessel, which could kill, or at minimum, you have to redo the operation. And so what they did is they basically used the same idea. You take a polymer, coat the stent, you put a different anti-cancer drug in, in this case, Taxol rather than VCNU, you locally deliver it, prevents the proliferation, and this is probably used in a million patients every year. And again, there's other kinds of systems where people are looking at these ideas too. Um, the very last thing that I wanted to go over today is could you use materials to not only deliver drugs, but create new tissues and organs? Here, the person I've worked very closely with is Jay Vacanti. Jay is a head of pediatric surgery at Mass General. And this is a, one of his patients who, uh, I remember Jay coming to me when he was at Children's Hospital in 1983 and showing me that and saying, is there some way we can help these children? Is there some strategy other than just transplantation? Which is what he was doing then. And so we started talking about this and we came up with uh, this following idea, which now is the basis of uh, what people call tissue engineering. The idea, and we published this way before people talked about stem cells, is that you could take virtually any cell type. Here are some shown here. Um, if you try to inject these cells in the body, not much happens, but it turns out the cells are smart. If you put cells close enough together, even in vitro, they can actually reform structures. This was shown actually nicely at Berkeley, where they took mammary epithelial cells, put them close enough together in vitro, they could actually make acinine and make milk. Um, so what we did is we, Jay and I, we'd create uh, three-dimensional polymer scaffolds where the cells could be close enough together to reform the structures. Also, the way you grow the cells is very important. It's not just simple tissue culture. You have to have the right stresses and so forth to actually make them grow in the right way. And then you could make the tissue. Just to show you a few pictures, um, we converted these into scaffolds where you'd have fibers and cells. 
And Prasad Shastri, who was one of my postdocs, he now runs a big institute in Germany, he actually worked out a way using CAD CAM techniques like computer-aided design to make these into virtually any shape. And then you could use things like three-dimensional printing or various foam techniques to make these in, into different kinds of, of forms. So let me just give you an example, um, and this is pure speculation. But let's say 30 or 40 years from now, somebody comes to a plastic surgeon and they say, we want a new nose. So my speculation is that there'll be a computer screen and you'll have a, you can look at the screen and you can have your choice of 40 different noses, any shape. And to that end, what Prasad did is he worked out ways to make those noses. They're actually three-dimensional, 98% porous, but you could take cartilage cells from the patient themselves, I'll give an example shortly, and make the nose. Now this is kind of like a regular nose, but let's say somebody wants an upturned nose. Well, you just take a little bit of this off. That's not so hard to do. What if somebody wanted a hooked nose? I mean, they probably wouldn't. <laughs> but if they did, we just give them a little bit more. So you could really do these any way you want. To this end, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Chuck Vacanti. Chuck actually was in the newspaper today, worked with us. Uh, and Chuck actually uh, was the one uh, with the two people who just had the discovery of how you could give acid to convert certain cells to stem cells. But now we go back to the 1980s when he'd get started working with Jay and myself. And one of the things he did was make new cartilage. And here, uh, with these are nude mice. Here, we redid this guy's skull. Here, this guy's cheek. If you open the animals up and look at them, it's pure white glistening cartilage. Histologically, it also looks like cartilage, but it turns out that the mechanical strength of this cartilage is not as good as you want, say, if you're a runner. Uh, so you're not really able at this point to help people who are runners. But there are various things you can do from a cosmetic standpoint. And actually, recently, what we've been doing is working with the Army. They actually came to talk to Jay and myself and Linda Griffith, who was one of my postdocs, said, could you actually make new ears or other body parts for soldiers who came back from Iraq and Afghanistan? who don't have those parts. And let me just show you a little bit about what was done. Linda actually, uh, who's now a professor at MIT, made a scaffold in the form of a human ear. You have, uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of it. Over time, the polymer will dissolve, uh, cells grow on it, and matrix is made. And over time, the polymer will fully dissolve and you'll just get pure cartilage. And Chuck actually did put this on a rabbit. Here's the rabbit with the human ear. And what Jay did, we have not put it on the soldiers yet, but under physician-sponsored INDs, actually this was at Children's Hospital, uh, here's a 12-year-old boy who didn't have a chest. So Jay operated on him. I should point out, this 12-year-old boy, like many others, wants to play baseball. But if you look at his chest, he's got no chest covering his heart, so he could actually get hurt very badly if the ball hit him. And so uh, we made a polymer scaffold for him, and Jay took his own cells and made him a new chest, and he's doing fine. As a second example, and this is more from a license standpoint, uh, Jay and I uh, licensed some of the work to different companies, and they've actually made new skin for burn victims that's now FDA approved. Let me show you that. Here's a um, two-year-old boy who's very, very badly burned. But you can take the product, which is neonatal skin fibroblasts, put it on the scaffold. You can actually cryopreserve these, and you can put it in the child at uh, time zero, and it looks like this. But if you come back three weeks later, it looks like this. And six months later, like this. These are now approved by the FDA for patients with uh, burns and diabetic skin ulcers. Last example, which is still early, Erin Levick, one of our graduate students, was interested in could you someday even help people with spinal cord injuries. So she worked originally with Ted Tang who's at the VA, and uh, Evan Snyder, who's a stem cell expert, neuronal stem cell expert, who's now at the Burnham. And uh, what they did is they made a scaffold. Erin is a material scientist. She's now at Case as a professor <clears throat> to try to mimic the gray and white matter of the spinal cord. And um, she has an outer part that can help provide axonal guidance and an inner part, which is porous, where she'd put neuronal stem cells. Here's a, here's a picture of what it looks like. And what I'm going to show you are some of the animal studies that she and Ted did. Um, the first trials were a huge amount of work. Basically, what they did is 50 animals for 400 days. They followed them. Um, there were the, all of these. You'd put the implant in. We'd make the rats uh, paraplegic. You'd put the implant in. And uh, 
you'd follow it. And, and basically the implants are put in in each case within 24 hours of the injury. So what I'm going to do is show you a mean from one of the control groups. There are three sets of controls, sham, uh, cells by themselves, or polymer by itself. And uh, I'll show you mean at 100 days of the control group. And what you see when you look at these animals, there are like 12 or 13 in each group, is uh, he's a, there's a scoring system, BBB scoring system. He has about a 5 out of 20. The way, part of how you score is the paws are splayed in an awkward fashion, and these animals are not able to support their own weight. We'll just follow him for a little bit. But if you put the implant in, and particularly if you put the implant in with cells, they do better, and they, you can actually get up to a 14 on the mean, uh, which is the average of the treated group. And let me just show you that, also at 100 days. And it's not a cure by any means. They're still clumsy, but he's doing much better. He is able to support his weight, and he's kind of heavy. Notice the paws are also splayed more normally. And you can see him walking and so forth. Again, hardly a cure, but certainly an improvement. My wife, uh, Laura, said not to leave that on too long either. So where we went from here, again, one of my, uh, another student who actually was paralyzed for a time once, Frank Reynolds, heard me give a talk on this and wanted to start a company on this. And then he licensed it from MIT, got several very good surgeons like Eric Woodard and John Slotkin to work on it. And so what they ended up doing was a big trial with monkeys, primates. And I thought I'd show you that. Basically, they repeated what was done on the rats. And I'll just show you the monkey trial. First, again, the uh, control group at about uh, 10 weeks, and then an experiment. So here's the control. Notice there's a treadmill, and he has trouble moving this leg. This is the leg that was injured. And in a second, we'll put on the experiment, uh, which uh, is treated. And again, it's not a cure, but he's doing better. You can see him running much, much better on the treadmill than the control. And this would be true in every single one of the treated ones compared to the control. And as a consequence of this, what's happened is now the FDA gave the go-ahead for the first human trials, which I believe will start hopefully in uh, April. Uh, they actually approved it at six uh, different medical centers uh, for a local company. And uh, mostly it's to look at safety, and it'll be aimed at just putting the polymer scaffold in by itself. But it's very exciting to get to these points because when you finally get to humans, I mean, that's clearly the animal model that you want. And again, um, we'll see how we do, and I expect various iterations, but it's the beginning of something that I think we'll learn a lot from. In a larger sense, you know, what I've tried to go over today, I, I should point out in a larger sense, I've pro we've probably raised many more questions than we've answered. But I often think back to 1974, 40 years ago, when I started working in Dr. Folkman's lab at Harvard Medical School. And these whole ideas of combining engineering and materials, you know, and engineer, were really looked down upon. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's just such a long journey. And today, even though I feel that there's an awful long way to go, we've seen, you know, I've tried to go over different examples where you can combine biology and medicine on the one hand, and engineering and chemistry on the other. So we see examples of where you can do that and begin to create different kinds of products that can relieve suffering and prolong life. And my hope is that people in this audience and actually all over the world, that this is actually just the tip of the iceberg of how you can use interdisciplinary research uh, to do these kinds of things. It's really a pleasure to speak to all of you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Peter Lawrence, uh, Biomimicry New England. I'm curious, you were talking about the alternative approach instead of rummaging around the house for how a problem was solved, coming up with an alternative material that has the performance, the even surface arrangement. Do you have any examples of your postdocs um, looking to nature? Uh, okay, how, does, how did nature come up with that? And yeah, actually, very good question. So let me just give you one example of a postdoc. So, uh, so I had a very good postdoc, Yudong Wang, and then another postdoc, Jeff Karp. One is now professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and the other actually at Harvard. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things that uh, began to do was say, well, could we ever make a material that is kind of elastic and fairly strong? And so what Yudong did, this was an original paper in uh, Nature Biotech, was take the properties 
that were in elastin and, um, and collagen and create a synthetic polymer out of it, which we actually call biorubber. Jeff actually then used it. In fact, the Boston Globe has written several articles on this in the last two months. I mean, we wrote them too, but then, you know, one was in Science Translational Medicine and, uh, you know, to, to make new adhesives out of it. That, that if, in fact, Children's Hospital, one of the surgeons, uh, Pedro Del Nido, they actually use this, uh, this bio rubber to actually uh, seal wounds and, and things like that. So, uh, so that's actually an example where we kind of used biomimicry to make a brand new polymer and hopefully, uh, you know, bring it to patients someday. Hi, Professor Langer. Um, I'm Ishwara here. I'm a postdoc at uh, Harvard uh, University. It was such a pleasure to hear you talk, and uh, it was great to hear your story. And I have a question in this regard, which is basically, you know, you being in the field for so long, kind of getting your perspective on where we are going and what would be your advice to young postdocs who are in the field? What, what should our priorities be? especially considering the given funding scenario. <laughs> well, let me forget the funding scenario for a second and then come back to that. Um, I still am a big believer in following your dreams. You know, I just think whatever your dreams are, I'm a big believer in following them. And, you know, and I, I think that you want to follow your dreams. And I also think the other part is don't give up easily. On the funding specifically, I mean, that's harder now than it maybe has been in a number of years. But my advice on that is to think out of the box. I mean, the most natural place that people would try to get funding, as I mentioned, might be places like NIH. And the advice I give my students is to think about two things. One, where might you get money that people might not necessarily look at? I mean, the fact is, you know, when I look even what we do and others, you know, you can get money from various foundations. There's all kinds of branches of the government and there's foreign governments and foreign agencies. And, and, and also you can do things like we did, which is file patents and get it from companies. So I think you want to think not just about the regular ways of getting money, but other ways of getting money. And then the second thing I usually try to say is, well, every funding place has its own rules. And probably since they control the funding, it's good to think what the, understand what those rules are. And they're very different. You know, NIH would have different kinds of rules, I think, for getting the funding than DARPA and, and companies. For example, I'd say a company might, a patent means a lot. DARPA, some crazy idea might mean a lot and preliminary results don't mean as much. NIH, you know, you might want to have significant preliminary results. So every place you want to think through uh, how they think when you write your grants. And I'd probably tell people to get, uh, you know, some mentor, you know, who's maybe a senior member of your faculty to help review them and to help you guide you through that process. Thank you so much. Sure. Hello, Professor. Uh, I'm a postdoc from the University of Michigan. I just have a quick question about the microcircuit chip. Uh, so what exact frequency is used, and is there any interference at the frequency for the chip? So what was the first part of your question? What is the frequency that is used for the chip? Oh, OK. Well, you can use different frequencies depending on what you want to use. We picked ones. I, think, I can't remember the number of uh, kilohertz it is, but but uh, you can use different frequencies. It's just a question of how you set it up. Um, you know, right now they've picked the one I think that the FCC approves, but uh, it, you don't have, there's really no limit. You can use whatever you want. And does it interfere? Is that a problem of interference for the frequency? Well, we haven't seen that, and I don't think you'd expect that. I mean, like I say, the one, they, I think they picked that for a reason because, uh, you know, I think they picked one that, that, like I say, that the FDA and FCC approved just because you're not going to get interference. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, the, uh, the spinal cord uh, uh, experiments, the cases were like single limb problems, but I wonder if this has potential for... Uh, more severe, uh, like general paralysis or locked in kinds of cases, and also uh, brain damage uh, uh, cases and, you know, uh, from stroke uh, and so forth. Do you see it down the line? So I, I also, the question is, is could this be helpful for more general paralysis and for stroke? I mean, it's so hard to know, and I, I don't want to oversell. I mean, we're still incredibly early even where we are. Um, Evan Snyder, who I mentioned, has done some work on stem cells for things like stroke. But I, I think the road is long for all these things. And like I say, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think someday, I, it's hard to, 
give a number of years, but I think someday uh, these kinds of general approaches will, will be helpful for problems That's what like I mean. that. In principle, could it have a much broader? Well, I, think, I, 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 I would like to think so, but I mean, it'll take a lot of work and a long time. That would be my projection. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Colleen Cavanaugh, professor of biology on this side of the river at Harvard. Um, to extend on the using nature as uh, an example, is there anything using other animals like business threads of mussels or uh, calcification patterns uh, for bivalves? Yeah, well, well, actually there are different things, you know, and I mentioned Jeff Karp before. I mean, just to pick, it's not exactly what you're asking, but one of the things that Jeff, who was one of my postdocs did, and now he's a professor at Harvard Medical School, he's used a lot from biomimicry. So like, for example, he picked the gecko. You know, and so he, gecko is, you know, he wants to make new adhesives, and the gecko actually has a nanostructure that helps it adhere to things. So he actually created materials out of, you know, we use some nano patterning to make gecko like structures. And he's used some other things to, to, you know, from jellyfish and mussels and so forth. So I think there's a lot of great examples from nature. I think Joanna Eisenberg here has done some interesting work along those lines as well. So I, I think there are a number of great examples out of nature where people can do kind of biomimicry. Right. If I could just ask another yeah, question, sure. that is, how much is it really translational to humans, though? I mean, I know lots of papers, lots of people have been doing this, but really moving the way you're showing, you know, really remarkable results. Well, to move it to humans, again, I'm talking about 40 years work and probably <laughs> literally the way we've moved it to humans, I don't want to over credit myself. One of the things that we've done, which I didn't spend too much time, I kind of alluded to it. One of the, my strategies for getting it to humans is to start companies, you know, and so what we've done a lot of, and was maybe mentioned a little bit in the introduction, because I, that's always my goal. I want to see it get to humans. But it takes a fortune to get to humans, sometimes billions of dollars. So the model that we've used, and we've used it quite extensively, is, is patent things, have venture capitalists finance those things, and start companies. Some of those companies have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's really because they've raised that kind of money that, and, and, and it's all the people at those companies, not just me, you know, many of them are my former students, and you know, some of the companies now have over a thousand people. It's really the efforts of all those people that have taken these ideas and, and made those things happen. But I, I think if it were not for the companies and all the money that they raised, that you know, we—I mean, it's that—that's a whole strategy thing that that I kind of—I don't want to say fell into, but that I've used uh, over the last 30 years. And and it's really the licenses from our patents the creation of those companies and the people of those companies developing manufacturing plants, doing clinical trials, you know, and really driving hard to go through the FDA and get products out to patients. I have a Harvard Business School lecture that I use on that. Well, I was going to say, would you advise postdocs, graduate students, to take business classes and entrepreneurial aspects? I mean, many scientists are not going to. Yeah, well, you know, the problem is, I mean, it's a great question. The difficulty that I've seen just personally having been involved in a number of companies is I don't know that there's a business class. I mean, there is actually, I think Vicky Sato gives a business class. I think they actually, they actually have a case study on our lab and actually on one of the companies we've started. She was actually kidding me that the students wanted to learn something other than what we did when I saw her a few weeks ago. But, but, but I think that, you know, I just don't know. And again, people here would be as good a judge as I. I just don't know how much you learn from a class. I mean, the problem that I found with companies is it's, it's, I've learned by my failures, you know, and I've learned by what happens. You know, so much of it's about people and about things that are, are very hard to predict and very hard to learn. And so I think it's like sort of like hard knocks. You just go through it and you hopefully get a little smarter each time. But I, it probably would be great if there are classes, and I think her class and others at the business school are probably you know, somewhat helpful. First of all, thank you very much for the lecture. And um, I'm a Harvard freshman, Elgin Gulpunar. I wanted to ask something about the networks of polymers that you use to um, build the cellular structure on. And I saw that there were examples such as livers. I mean, I, I can't think of it being used to create skin or cartilage or ear, more uniform types of structures, but um, how does that 
network actually translate into a functional liver because that was one of the organs there. Oh. How does it translate into that instead of a cellular um, statue? Yeah, well, so the liver, of course, is going to be more complex than the skin, and the question is what you exactly try to do. Jay Vacanti, who I mentioned, you know, he was actually a liver specialist and has done a lot of work on the liver. I think that usually when you do these things, you know, you want to bite off, do things in small bites. And I don't know that something that, so what people have tried to do in the liver, and it's still hard, is A, do something like a some bridge to transplant, which might be, you know, something outside the body, and then you know, maybe use a single cell, not all five cells in the liver, to maybe try to treat an enzyme deficiency disease. So people have tried to do things that are simpler, and, and even trying to do those things has not been easy. So I think you start with simpler steps. Hopefully, as you understand things better, if you have some success, you could translate it into more complex situations. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Um um, I'm a Harvard undergraduate. I have a question regarding what you mentioned earlier about your dreams in chemistry education, where you got started. Did you ever actually go back to try to address chemistry education? Well, I try, you know, I, what I, one of the things I've actually spent a lot of time doing, and still spent quite a bit of time doing, is lecturing at high schools and even grammar schools and having kids come to our lab to go over things like chemistry and chemical engineering. I don't know that I've ever come up beyond what I actually did then in terms of a brand new curriculum. Um, but I, I, I still to this day actually, you know, I mean, I give, give quite a few lectures to high schools. And, uh, you and, think of Richard Feynman for physics. What's that? Richard Feynman for physics, how he redefined the physics curriculum. Right, lectures. right. Yeah, well, I, I, I think we haven't, I mean, physics, of course, will be tougher. But uh, <laughs> I would probably fail it. Uh, but I think, you know, we, what, what I'd like to try to do is get students excited. I mean, part of even the curriculums we developed were aimed at getting students really excited about science and what science can do. That was sort of behind a lot of the experiments that, you know, we designed. And that's still part of what I try to impart when I, you know, go to the high schools or have the high schools come here or come to MIT. First, uh I wanted to thank you for the presentation. I thought it was wonderful. I'm Megan Richards. I'm from the European Commission, and I spent many years funding research similar to this. Not me personally, but we just handed the money out. The interesting That's people. good. But the question I had for you was about the um, tumor testing. As far as I understood, you said that the testing of the tumor reduction activities was in Denmark, you mentioned, Sweden, and Finland. And I wondered why that hadn't been done in the US. Was that a funding issue? Was it a legal or regulatory issue? Yeah. Or was it just by pure chance? Or perhaps you had partners there? Yeah, well, I think, well, first of all, I mean, th those decisions about where the trials get, I, let me try to break it down into a couple of things. I mean, your last part of the question is right. You know, what we do is, you know, we kind of license it to the company, and the company kind of makes a decision where it happens, you know, and they have much better people than me, you know, clinicians trying to figure that out. When I look back, though, uh, sometimes there is a feeling that doing clinical trials overseas is a good idea, particularly for medical devices. I should say that in the case of the nanoparticles, uh, all the clinical trials so far have been done in the US. But for you know, the, the wafers and for uh, the other, the uh, microchips, they did do them in Europe. And I, I, my gathering, my thinking is that they probably felt the, the bars were lower in terms of, you know, trying to get them done there. And certainly I, I, I hear, you know, people feel like medical devices, you know, the regulations overseas are, are better than they are here. But I don't want to claim any expertise on that. It's really never been my decision. I mean, I'm, I'm not a clinician, you know, and so they ha usually have somebody who's in charge of clinical trials at these companies, you know, figuring it out, and they, they probably know a lot more than me. So it was the companies that were carrying the comp it? In every oh, case, yeah. the, okay. these things have been decided by a company we license it to, and they have a, a strategy, you know, a chief medical officer that usually figures out, you know, where the clinical trials should be done. They obviously get lots of advice. I've seen them done in the U.S. too. I mean, they did do some uh, clinical trials, quite a few clinical trials in the U.S. as well. But sometimes I think that they feel the bar might be better in, in, yeah, in Europe. Best. Just to, since I have the microphone, sure. I'll make a pitch for the uh, EU funding program, which is uh, starting this year, uh, called Horizon 2020, which is open to uh, also researchers from all around the world. So if you're interested and you can't find it from NIH, there's another 
solution for it. Sorry. Good. Well, I'd love to get that, uh, get all the information. I'm sure everybody here would. Thank you.